My name is Diego Meyasu. I am a business and ecosystem developer here at uh, Nomadic Labs, and I will be the session moderator. Um, today, we are very happy to welcome Wayne Chang, CEO of Spruce, uh, for today's session. He will be talking about self-sovereign identity and storage. Um, Wayne will specifically review the results of support with Tezos addresses, uh, use cases that have been deployed, uh, Tezos DID methods and Tezos profiles. Um, he will also give an overview of the Trail Bits uh, audit. Please feel free to ask your question directly on the chat uh, as a Q&A uh, session will happen on the end of the presentations and we will be able to read and uh, ask your questions uh, live. So thank you for being here. Hi, my name is Wayne Chang. I'm the founder and CEO of Spruce. I'm here to talk to you about decentralized identity and storage, especially within the Tezos ecosystem. My background is I formerly worked at Consensus under the identity team. And Spruce is a bunch of user control maximalists. We care a lot about giving users more sense of digital ownership. The company was started about over a year ago, and we've been through the Y Combinator program, and we're building a lot of identity and data use cases. Especially in Web3, we think one of the big missing pieces is decentralized identity that allows us to build more complex systems through the signing, sharing, and storage of trusted data. For example, if you wanted to build a car sharing app that was decentralized and didn't have a central intermediary, and you know, as a result, you would only have to pay the protocol fee, just the gas cost you would want to know something about the counterparty before you stepped into a vehicle or something like that. Same thing with decentralizing maybe a home sharing program if you wanted to do vacation rentals from a peer to peer way. You might want to know something about who you're renting from and who's going to stay at your apartment. So being able to represent these data digitally from trusted sources, for example, the DMV or the Department of Motor Vehicles for in the case of drivers, um, perhaps insurance companies for both drivers and homeowners. You know, there are a lot of data that help you reduce the so-called transaction cost by introducing trust into the interaction. And we think that decentralized identity is a way to do that while keeping things peer to peer. In order for commerce to move decentralized and more efficient, we think data must also move decentralized. So with centralized identity, a lot of the real world um, value that's getting digitized relies on these uh, data silos, which are starting to become choke points for digital value systems, either because um, you know people don't want to share their data, which is totally fair if that's what their business model is based on. Um, and trying to accelerate this part allows us to do more in the digital value world. Centralized database concentrate not just informational power, but also risk and liability. We've seen a lot of data breaches over the past few years, huge ones affecting millions of people, right? And if it were more decentralized, uh, you know, you might find that it would be harder to um, infiltrate or extricate so much data at once. For example, governments have an excellent track record of being able to custody private keys and not let them slip. But data management is just such a big challenge that no one really has a great track record in terms of being able to store big silos of data uh, very concretely. Even companies that hire you know, the best engineers to do that regularly have breaches because there's just so much territory. So both legal and legal in industries have uh, are devoted to non-consensual data sharing and they're growing every year. These are everything from uh, places that um, collect information on people and try to build profiles and uh, resell that profile to you know, um, basically help commerce or other aspects of their customers. And um, also people who just uh, voluntarily share data too. And with decentralized identity, I think we have an opportunity to bring some more of the sophistication because one of the big differences is, is that whereas we have a trust model with centralized identity, where you know you're talking to a specific database and you kind of have assurance of the data as a result, what if we were able to make it much more granular and you're able to basically um, wrap the data with its origin, with who issued it or who stated that fact, and um, basically kind of like a bill of lading in the shipping industry every cargo container comes with a bill of lading through the system. You can see its origin, who signed off on it, other inspections and checks. So I'll talk about how to do that in the later part of this uh, demonstration. But how do blockchains get involved? Well, uh, moving to a public private key world makes this so much easier. And fortunately with Tezos, we have three different curves for to use for this. 
Um, we have ED25519, we have, uh, we have SecP256K1, and uh, P256. Uh, the last one is a little controversial, but it's a uh, NIST recommended curve, which has a pretty huge implication for working with institutions and governments. And ED25519, I believe, is on the recommendation track for NIST as well. I believe that um, the EIDAS framework in the EU actually takes a lot from NIST. But being able to start with this ecosystem of accounts that already exist are based on um, elliptic cryptography, elliptic curve cryptography, and um, able to uh, be used as identifiers instead of, uh, let's say, someone's email is really powerful primitives. We can start using that to um, do a lot with decentralized identity. For example, within the Web3 ecosystem itself, we have NFT creator authenticity using social account proofs. I'll go through an example where we have over 10,000 of these deployed in production. We have cross-chain reputation activity for under-collateralized lending and similar use cases. Most DeFi lending is uh, built on over-collateralized positions and you could borrow a subset of that. Um, and this also is adjusted for the volatility of the underlying asset and some other factors. So if you actually want to uh, put up less uh, in stake to borrow more, right? There must be some informational component to it. You have to inject some kind of trusted data. So that's where decentralized identity is helpful. DAO governance and data security for effective management. If you want to hire someone as a DAO and DAOs are hiring people, or if you want to permission certain access, you might want to know a thing or two about your DAO members and it might be different things. We like to think about information minimization. So only collecting minimal set of information you need for something to happen and nothing more and preferably uncorrelated data at that so uh, being able to represent this digitally and generate a new key pair for an interaction or something is all very possible and then moving out of blockchains we have data supply chains that can track and trace data movement what if something has been through a PII scrubbing process and we're pretty confident that it's free of personally identifiable information, right? Is there a way that we can, you know, stamp that, sign off on that data and then pass it along like that bill of lading I was talking about. Software security is a special case of this with signing build certificates and audits, being able to see who uh, actually created this Docker image before you run it in a production environment is generally a good thing. And there has been a huge increase in focus on making sure that the continuous in uh, integration infrastructure is actually very trusted because there are tons of vulnerability points there. So decentralized identity, um, when you talk about credentialing or building up someone's digital identity, typically this workflow taken from the verifiable credentials uh, data model specification is very relevant where you have an issuer, a holder, a verifier, and a verifiable data registry. For example, a university issues to a student their diploma. They're taking, the student's taking their digital diploma and presenting it to an employer who wants to make sure that they actually went to the institution they said they did. And all of this is coordinated with a verifiable data registry that is basically a foundation that everyone agrees upon. Okay, these are the valid universities. You know, these are the types of diplomas and how you represent them. It's the common basis for a lot of things. But similarly, in a DAO uh, that you want to figure out if someone's going to pay back a loan or something, the issuer might be someone who has lent to the person before. The holder might be the, but the borrower and the verifier might be, you know, the new lenders. And they would also use a verifiable data registry to coordinate things. So this model is very flexible and typically comes out um, teasing these out uh, so that you have individual actors uh, in many centralized identity systems. A lot of these are, uh, you know, kind of squished together to a single service. And maybe you have a user account to access uh, your holder privileges. So W3C verifiable credentials are the data format that we use to represent a lot of digital statements. They are a, a machine readable vocabulary. It's a JSON. It has a mode of operating where we can use the resource description framework that Tim Berners-Lee invented. And uh, a bunch of other people at W3C have really pushed forward over the years and be, uh, be able to make a semantic knowledge graph of everything as it relates to each other. We also support JSON schema, uh, the, the spec does, that is, um, it's not a normative requirement, but it's really being able to capture an assertion about reality. And it's extremely useful if you add semantic context to that. You're also able to see who's attesting to this statement about reality. 
In this case, you know, we have an issuer, uh, Bookface, which is a website on Y Combinator, issuing a credential that says someone's an alumni of it, the program. And you're able to demonstrate cryptographically that um, someone signed it correctly. Verifiable credentials work completely with HTTPS. They don't need DIDs or blockchain, uh, but we think that it's very interesting when you have the combination of them, enter W3C decentralized identifiers. Decentralized identifiers are a URI, and their job is to basically establish the control authority for that identifier. How they do that is they resolve to this so-called did document, this JSON stuff, that describes important fat aspects of the decentralized identifier, including how do you authenticate as the did controller? Or what service endpoints does this decentralized identifier support? If you wanted to open a chat message, for example, with the holder or the controller. And specifically, there are three parts to a decentralized identifier. The scheme itself, which is always DID, the did method, what's the storage I go to to look for this document, and also the did method specific identifier. How do I index the storage to get to this document? And the method doesn't have to be a static storage like um, Postgres or anything like that. Um, it can even be a set of instructions. For example, interpret the did method specific identifier as a public key and the holder of the private key can identify as the did controller without hitting any networks. So the did method is really a resolution algorithm more so than a specific storage. But it gets very interesting when you do use, for example, a public blockchain like Tezos for storage, because you can set up a smart contract to enable things like key rotation and broadcasting of service endpoints. And the smart contract can only be updated by the did controller because it's protected by the smart contract code. So this gets us towards what some call self-sovereign identity in which the user is able to control aspects of their own identifier and identity. And they don't have to go through a central intermediary. Um, in contrast, if you use the email service provider, which are quite large and they remove access from uh, your account, you lose a lot of access, not just to the identifier, but everything the identifier gave you access to. So this helps you move from not your keys, not your coins over to not your keys, not your identifier. And you can use that for a lot of services. So specifically with the Tezos ecosystem, uh, Spruce has collaborated on two different DID methods and a lot of this space is still emerging. Right now, the, it is still a draft specification that is undergoing, um, uh, attempting to become a proposed recommendation or um, uh, so an official recommendation of W3C. And uh, the, uh, there's a lot of different DID methods out there. Uh, specifically, we wanted to use some great properties of Tezos to make sure that um, we could evaluate how a DID method on Tezos looks like. And fortunately, we've produced two of them. The first one is DID TZ, which is a fully featured DID method that comes with a key rotation and service endpoints. It can also be based on a smart contract. Uh, you can just put the Tezos address after DID TZ and it's a valid decentralized identifier. Part of the resolution strategy is to, if you, uh, is to look up a contract that defines the metadata, but if you can't find one, uh, then a key or the Tezos account embedded in the decentralized identifier can just be the default way to become a DID controller. And of course, if you specify a smart contract there instead, then you just look up the smart contract. We're also happy to report that we've been able to collaborate with some ecosystem members to formally verify aspects of the DID method, including the key rotation works properly and other items. Um, you can find, uh, we use the Micho Coke framework to formally verify it in Coke uh, by, with a construction. Another DID method we had was a more lightweight one, but uh, did not require any blockchain interaction. And this one is uh, closer to the vein of um, it's kind of a subset of the functionality of did TZ, but um, a lot of people have uh, found this interesting. And that would be did PKH TZ. Did PKH stands for did public key hash, and it should represent any public key hash uh, accounts. But the drawback of did PKH is that there's no key rotation or service endpoints because it doesn't touch the network or any backup data stores at all. It just uses the derived uh, material from the public key the TZ1, TZ2, TZ3 addresses as uh, part of the verification method. So when someone signs something, issues a verifiable credential that we went over using their Tezos address keys, uh, the keys behind their address, I should say, 
then there, we're able to verify that indeed this Tezos address did issue that verifiable credential, allowing Tezos addresses to say things about anything. And you would need a verifiable data registry to interpret it. But these are some pretty important core identity primitives that allow um, Tezos decentralized identifiers and therefore Tezos accounts to interoperate with a bunch of other systems, including X509 systems that are pretty widespread in use, including PGP, including SSH keys. So this gives us some pretty great interoperability. So a demonstration of uh, what we have built with decentralized identifiers and verifiable credentials is Tezos Profiles. It's a web application that gives users uh, control of their digital identity for use across platforms. It allows you to create verified profiles by demonstrating control over public social media accounts and by self-attesting that information. The really important part is that we solve creator, um, uh, we, start, we solve creator fraud this way. So if someone is copy minting or minting an NFT and claiming that they actually made the art, but they didn't, you can basically verify the association with social media accounts to get a better sense of if that's a real artist or not. It's being able to uh, bound to key material in the same way that Keybase has, but we use open standards and we allow for a multi-party verifier system. So how it works is that the user enters their user account in this web application. And then we have a signature pop that uh, the user is attesting, the handle is linked to a Tezos account, and they sign on that message and they tweet it out. When they tweet it out, what you're able to see here is a two-way link because in the first place, the user was tweeting that this Twitter handle is linked to the Tezos account and they signed it with the Tezos account. We can verify that. And by the user tweeting it out from their Twitter account, we can also verify that they're in control of their Twitter account, at least enough to make uh, tweets. This is a slightly different security model than OAuth 2. Uh, and one of the big differences of using this versus the OAuth 2 model is that you can leave a public artifact that other people can go and verify against the Twitter service. We also support additional workflows like GitHub DNS records, so you can update a text record to contain that. We support a Discord handle verification as well a lot of people have been asking for. And we have over 10,000 deployed in production. In order to, um, so the um, assertion is represented as a verifiable credential that um, the user can then upload to their self-sovereign storage. Basically, they can use their Tezos accounts to sign for access to a storage framework. We thought it was much better than storing it on IPFS because once you store something on the main IPFS network, it goes broad and wide, right? And you don't really have a chance to delete it or revoke it. It's just kind of out there. So if we use a more controlled storage that the user controls, I'll talk about Kepler a little bit at the end, then basically the user has a chance to delete their data, which is actually really important for uh, being able to give users control. And the Tezos profile is actually a smart contract containing a list of URIs where people can go to access credentials. The, U the credential hashes are pretty random enough that uh, if uh, someone were to remove them, you know, it would be very difficult to discover what was originally in that credential, just given timestamps and other entropy that you find in there. And once it's deployed, the user can view existing credentials with the viewer, either for themselves or others. Basically, in this, in my account, I have Twitter, Ethereum, Discord, uh, a website, DNS verification, and a GitHub verification. And I also have a self-attested verifiable credential containing a link to my profile picture, my preferred alias, my description and website, and things like that. Um, you can access the credentials as verifiable credentials, download them, independently verify that uh, it was true, or even visit the original tweet links of any of these services. External applications can also use our API to confirm uh, the link between the account and the credentials. And basically that's what Hikik Monk does when they have a Tezos profiles icon here on the right, it looks like a square with a corner missing. And they're able to pull in the credentials and verifications as part of the user profile. And the great part about Tezos profiles is that it's standalone. So it powers any Tezos decentralized application or DAP and they can all use Tezos profiles and let the user independently verify that the credentials about a certain Tezos address are indeed true. 
They can do that in their front end browser. They can download it and do it independently. It's all about you know, who signed for that statement and attestation. So talking a little bit about Spruce ID, the decentralized identity toolkit, um, we basically use this to construct TZ profiles or Tezos profiles. And DidKit provides really good um, cross-platform handling for decentralized identifiers and uh, verifiable credentials, and also a bunch of Tezos signing. We had to implement some signature suites in Rust for TZ1, 2, and 3 um, to make sure that we could sign and verify things correctly against the wallet implementations. So how it works in Tezos profiles is that we actually compile it to Wasm and run it in the front end uh, browser. It's written in Rust at the core. But uh, through compilation, C ABI bindings, et cetera, it has compatibility with a lot of different systems. We even have it working inside uh, mobile devices. So Rebase is the underlying protocol powering Tezos profiles that contains all those different workflows, bridging the public social media information. It's also built on DidKit because it's based on verifiable credentials and you're able to sign things with blockchain accounts, which is the functionality that DidKit also provides. Another item we're working on is Keylink. It's an in-development tool that links system accounts to keys. So if you already have a bunch of user accounts, how do people start using keys that are designated to them, right? And how does the administrator have the ability to set what's allowed to be signed or not? Maybe not every request should even be considered for signing by the user. And maybe we should display really, really nice interfaces for signing so the user can actually have consent at the moment of signing, right? One of the winning flows, I think, in, uh, for enterprise use cases and blockchains or just digital signing in general is redirecting over TLS, a signing request to the user who must authenticate to a service like Keylink. And once they're in, they can be the signing request if it's up to snuff with the IT administrator's policies. They can sign the request and through an HSM. Maybe at this point they have a multiple factor and they might have to also sign with their UB key to the system. Maybe it's a multi-sig scheme using threshold signing, for example. Um, there are a bunch of things that you can do there. And eventually after the user decides to sign or not, um, what they do decide to sign, you can redirect back over TLS to their asking service and that can submit the transaction on their behalf, issue the verifiable credential, whatever you need the signing for. That might be the most familiar path for people already used to things like the OAuth2 delegation screen today uh, to have a straightforward way to operate in a key-based world. And one of the core things that we think at Spruce is that the world is going to move towards public-private key pairs, and that's kind of one of the dependencies we have in our products. That's why we love working with blockchain ecosystems like Tezos. As mentioned, we got DidKit working inside um, mobile applications. We've embedded uh, this Rust compiled binary um, library into Flutter, which is a cross-platform mobile application. We also have native packages available for CocoaPods and um, Maven, which is uh, used by Android. Right now, um, it's undergoing an audit by Trail of Bits with the result to be disclosed uh, shortly, but you know, I was happy to report preliminary findings are pretty promising uh, in terms of we didn't find anything too severe or exploitable. Uh, so um, we're moving closer to real production. Once we have an audit and more confidence, we can remove the disclaimer from the repository and you know, it'd be really exciting to work on anyone who wants to consider high assurance use cases. And I'll end on a note about Kepler, our self-sovereign storage system. Basically, Kepler, we call it self-sovereign storage, or the cheeky way we say it is the new S3. And it's a decentralized storage network organized around data overlays called orbits. So we want everyone to be able to have a personal data store or have a data store for an organization, and it's called a Kepler orbit. The design goals are to achieve high availability through configurable consensus and how it's different than some projects like Filecoin and Arweave is that we're not going for crypto economic security um, at a high level. In fact, we love that those systems exist and we love to work with them, but what we're focused on is local consensus, being able to decide where data live or not, right? And how we do that is being able to let the user specify what hosts are allowed to host their data not pick like a random host in the set, but the user can actually you know, specify exactly which hosts and enter SLAs with those. 
that's how we take care of a lot of the ambiguity. Uh, we think it's a different problem than what we're trying to solve to create a global crypto economic model that ensures um, the data availability through incentives. We also think that it's important to have uh, private and permission storage sets so you can have replication that doesn't go past a certain point. Finally, we want to make it really easy to share files. So if you encrypt the content and put it in IPFS, um, you might be able to, you know, that might be fine for 10 years or so, depending on how much you believe in quantum cryptography advancements, um, but also it's harder to share. We don't have uh, a great solution today for proxy re-encryption. Let me know if you find one, but the ability to re-encrypt something on the fly for something someone else and the person re-encrypting it doesn't get access to the data. You know, it's a very difficult problem that has not been proven at scale in production to my knowledge. So uh, encrypting and putting IPFS makes you only use a pre-share key kind of agreement. Right. So instead we use, uh, because you, the user already trusts the host that they specify in Kepler, you can use a key pair and capability space permissioning model. So um, just a few more notes on this. Uh, and then I think that's the last slide. Uh, but basically um, what we're able to do is use a blockchain wallets as they exist to issue a capability, kind of like a hall pass. And you can take the hall pass and uh, the counterparty can basically demonstrate things that the whole pass specifies. Uh, you as the owner of the orbit will issue this whole pass by signing for it um, using your Web3 wallet. And uh, the users of your whole passes can sign with their wallet, maybe Temple from Tezos, for example, and they'd be able to demonstrate that they've countersigned it correctly to for a read access, perhaps. The whole pass says, you know, this Tezos address can read these files. Additionally, we're thinking about how to extend uh, capabilities with policy as code. Um, and that's uh, basically what we're working on next. So uh, if you are using Tezos profiles, uh, your data are stored in orbit, so therefore you can delete it. So thanks so much for listening to this presentation about decentralized identity and storage and the various directions we're going. Hopefully you found it interesting. If you would like to get in contact about any of this, use cases, have questions, you know, we love to chat with you. You can join our Discord, follow us on Twitter, or just reach out. I'm sure that uh, the emails will be made available after the seminar. We really thank Nomadic Labs for having us here and talking to the Tezos ecosystem and other folks who are interested. It's really a joy working with really amazing technologists who are so focused on getting things right. Uh, we really appreciate that. So thanks again, and see you soon. Bye. Okay, thank you, Wayne, for the video. Um, so I see that we do not have uh, any question on the chat. Um, I noted a few a few ones that popped in my head. Um, the first one is uh, regarding the um, uh, creative uh, fraud um, problem solving through Tezos profile. Um, does the NFT creator needs to be verified prior to minting in order to secure the artwork, or is it or can it be done afterwards? So after the creator has uh, um, uh, verified its identity, then will he be able to um, uh, secure all his uh, uh, artwork that has been um, created uh, prior to this? Yep, so that's a great question. So the question was, um, you know, does it have to be done before or after minting? Uh, we're talking yeah. about the verifications for the creators. And um, the answer is it could happen either way. And I think it really underscores how Tezos profile is like a standalone system that's highly composable into the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So basically it works with any NFT platform based on Tezos addresses and more. Uh, in fact, people are using it for airdrops and DeFi. People are, um, might even consider using the data to you know, figure out how to permission different pools in DeFi for people to participate with their capital. So um, the fact that, um, you know, Tezos Profiles is a separate smart contract than everything else, um, you're not locked into any DAP or any application. It's just your profile that can be used. Um, and we find that people like adopting this model too uh, on the application side because they like decentralization in Tezos as well. Okay. And uh, another one regarding uh, integrations. So you said that um, the, the Tezos profile app can be uh, integrated to any uh, Tezos, uh, Tezos DAP. Does it have uh, like 
specific requirements or any new um, decentralized application that would be uh, uh, integrated to the Tezos um, uh, ecosystem could benefit from the Tezos profile uh, solution? Yep, that's right. Um, anything can integrate with it. There are two ways to integrate. The first way is we do provide an API um, that will serve the credentials and everything over the API if people want uh, a very quick integration. If you want a deeper integration, we have an SDK where your users can independently grab the credentials from other users and verify that they've been signed correctly in the browser so you're not trusting a server. Okay, great. Um, thank you for all uh, this, uh, this information. It was really helpful uh, just for me for my activity as a business developer because I get lots of questions uh, specifically regarding the uh, protection of um, artist artwork on, um, uh, on the NFT space. And I believe the, the solution that you provide with uh, Tezos Profile is a great uh, solution to uh, problems that were seen ahead from the creators, uh, mainly the the fraud and replication of uh, uh, different artworks. And it, I'm sure it, it can be used also to um, to certify artwork from other uh, protocols. And like, if one artist can uh, certify that his artwork on Tezos was um, uh, created by him, uh, any other protocol that would be uh, replicating the NFT artwork can uh, be shown as uh, a fraud or... Uh, a replication. Uh, so it's it's really interesting and in tackling uh, uh, important issues with uh, the new uh, NFT market. Totally agreed. Great. Um, if um, I don't see any new question, uh, that's all on my side. If Wayne... Well, I uh, uh, see a few cropped up, I think. Um, if uh, there's time to answer those. Oh, yes. Um, Sorry, yeah. Could Tezos Profile be a replacement to Taurus Network authentication? Yeah, so um, we solve different problems uh, with respect to Tezos Profiles and uh, Taurus. So um, with Taurus, what they're trying to do is provide a way for you to use single sign-on from Web2 to uh, construct a Tezos address so you can use it on the network, right? This way, users can just log in um, as if they were uh, logging in with Google, but they really control a key that is reassembled in the browser for use. So that's the problem they're solving. Um, and we, we assume that's the case that a user already has a Tezos address to use Tezos profiles. So that's actually how it works together. Um, so we wouldn't be seeking to replace Taurus network authentication. If you've ever used the Kukai wallet, then there's a very similar flow because I believe it does use the Taurus network to reassemble a key securely. And then uh, you can then use it with Tezos profiles. So hopefully that's helpful uh, as to um, what the difference is. Okay. Uh, so we have another question. Um, have you considered using attribute-based signatures? Yeah. So we we have, um, and we are uh, we have merged in support for BLS twelve three eighty one, which is a pairing friendly elliptic curve that could be used for a, such selective disclosure. So yes, we're looking at it. Uh, it is a very nascent work, though. Um, you can look at it in our Rust libraries if you would like. OK. Um, I believe that's it. So again, thank you so much, Wayne, for uh, sharing your knowledge with us. And thanks to the audience for attending this research seminar session. And goodbye. <laughs>